Adolf Hitler wanted to be an artist. Thought he was going to be a great artist, but twice he failed to get into Vienna's Academy of Art. Twice he was rejected. What if Hitler had been admitted? Think of how the world might be different. How the world might have turned if, well, all we had was just a little bit more bad art. Monsters are made in moments. Life can turn on a dime. If I were to quiz the room this morning, go row by row, I'll bet you I'd find a dozen, two dozen, three dozen people who could take me to a moment in life where something happened and life turned on the dime. It's the young girl who was abused. It's the guy who didn't get the job. It was the divorce of parents. It was, it was the money that didn't come through in time. It was washing out of medical school. It was, what was it? There are moments where everything changes. Being a little too early or a little too late can make the difference in who you meet. That can make a difference in who you marry. It's all about where you were at what point in time. In the first class of my senior year, Theology 4, little blonde came walking by. I was seated on the second row. She came walking by, and I just, in a moment of boldness, said, why don't you just sit here by me? And she's still sitting by me all these years. That one moment changed it changed everything for me. My mother knows the girls I dated. She would tell you that one moment changed it. Have you ever sang that old country song, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers? God has a time and a place, and there are moments, and if we miss the moment, we miss life turning on a dime, and it can and it will. When life is viewed as an unending chain of events, then everything, in, what, in a way, everything changes everything. But then there are those moments of another magnitude altogether. They are moments that are so big, so powerful, that the rest of life not only flows out of those moments, but it continues to flow back into those moments. Those are big moments. Isaiah had a moment like that. I've had a moment like that, a moment where you truly say, this changes everything. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 6. Follow along in the text. It will be on the screens for you. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a, a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. This was Isaiah's moment. A moment that changed everything. The first thing of note that we really have to grasp here is there was a tectonic shift. A tectonic shift. Let me explain. Earthquakes 
result from the tectonic plates that form the mantle over the Earth's core, they shift. Pressure builds as they push up against one another, and that pressure mounts over time until the pressures can no longer be sustained, and there comes a, a shift. One plate will move over the other or a, a little bit beside the other, and it happens deep, deep in the earth. But when it happens, something gives, and everything on the top of the world is interrupted. It is shaken. It is reshaped. You look at the dramatic landscapes of the world and tectonic plates moving and shifting over time have created all that we look at. That, of course, by the design of God. Isaiah experienced here a tectonic shift. It was a seismic event in the spiritual realm. In Isaiah 6, we, we witness an event that's so sudden and so powerful that everything on the top of Isaiah's world was interrupted, it was shaken, it was reordered. See, Isaiah had come to age under King Uzziah, a king who had reigned for 52 years. That's rare as you study the kings in the Old Testament. 52 years, that's a long, long reign. Generally, that indicates goodness. 52 years, he led the nation in somewhat of a renaissance for Israel. He honored the Lord. Everything that he touched prospered. He was, he was somewhat like a little Solomon. He was entrepreneurial. He was innovative. He was supremely confident. He was a great builder. He was a military hero. His reign marked the beginning of a golden age. It looked like the golden age was dawning again for Israel. So it seemed. But with Uzziah in 2 Chronicles chapter 26 and 16, we find his fall. This verse captures it all. But when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. When he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. On top of the world, he presumed that he had no boundaries. That's the problem with success. The more success we get, the more we believe in our own abilities, the more we, we feel like we're entitled. It, it's something that we've created ourselves. We're proud of ourselves. The more success we gain, the less we, the less we really grasp that life has barriers. And the more rich and successful people become, the less they believe. You remember it was Leona Helmsley who said that taxes were for little people? Remember? She didn't feel like those boundaries applied any longer. Well, there's, there's, you don't have to be rich to have this prideful thing take over. You just have to be kind of the master of your own ship. And before long, you believe that you are the real motivator, the real mover and shaker and everything that goes. You no longer honor the Lord. You become the king of your own life. And it's amazing how quickly we will run beyond the boundaries that we once knew to be right and inviolate. And Uzziah decided that he was going to play the priest. He was a king, not a priest. Kings had a role that they were to play. The king, it, was, it was clearly defined for him. The priests had a role that they were to play. And God wanted no messing around between those roles. But Uzziah decided that he would play the priest. Success can make you just as crazy as a crack addict. People always worry about people when they're down and out. I worry about people when they're, when they're rising like a rocket. I've just seen too many go up like a rocket and come down like a rock. I've seen too many people who in the blush, the warm, the hot blush of, of achievement, lose their sense of who they are and whose they are. I'll tell you, it's pretty, it's pretty rough to look at when the crash takes place and they're finally picking up the pieces. I sat with someone in the, in the last month, I sat at a, a table with, with someone who has had everything but is in danger of losing everything. And I've got to tell you, it's, it's looking at two different people. Uzziah became strong and when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to destruction and he carelessly grabbed a censer. The censer would release the smoke, the incense, 
in the house of God. A few weeks ago, we had some smoke in here with some of the lights that we put in, and some people were pretty upset with, about that. And, and I'm okay with that. I realize it's all, it's all different for everyone. But the thing that really bothered me was people saying, that smoke made me feel like it was demonic or something. So this week, I went to the Bible, and I searched smoke from Genesis to Revelation. I spent some time on this, folks. And I found that every place you find smoke, it's in the house of God when the power of God is falling. We are sanctifying smoke in this house. If you see from some from now on, come with your Bible ready because the only place I can find that smoke has anything to do with hell is in Revelation 9 and Revelation 15. The rest of the places, the smoke is a sign of the presence and the power of God that rises in his house. But that's beside the point. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Back to my corner. I'm just stay in the box here. You know, it's safe here safe here. And, you know, I'll get some mail. It's okay. He grabbed that censer with the smoke, which is the incense, and he went into the house of God, a place that he was not, he was not allowed to perform that function. He was not a priest. And immediately, the scripture tells us, leprosy broke out on his forehead, right there where everyone could see it. And the priests immediately know what has happened because they're trying to, they don't want the king to do what the king is doing. They know better and leprosy breaks out on his forehead and they hustle him out. And the scripture, the scripture is exact enough to say nobody wanted to get out of there faster than Uzziah. And he lived, the once great king lived his final days as a leper. And his son named Jothan, his son ruled as his regent until Uzziah died. And Uzziah's death was a, it was a national tragedy. It hung like a pall over the entire nation because their once great king, who had not reproduced himself at all in his son, the once great leader, who had left no real successor, is suddenly taken off the stage, and he's taken off the stage in shame. He's a leper. He must, if someone comes close, he must announce himself as unclean. He was the king. He was the sovereign. He was majestic. He was robed beautifully. He lived in the palace, and he moved in power, and now he must shout out, I'm unclean. And he was that way until the day that he died. And when he died, it was the end of an era. And Isaiah, who according to Jewish tradition was a member, a member of the royal house, saw his once perfect world cratered. Not unlike the child who hears one day after school that mom and dad are divorcing. That's an earthquake. That's an earthquake. Their world is shattered. Maybe it was something else for you. But there are those moments. This was a tectonic shift for Isaiah. This was an earthquake. Uzziah was dead. And Isaiah's life that had been lived in power politics and the royal court and the temple and building this glorious state, suddenly his hero king dies. And in the midst of it all, God gives Isaiah a greater vision. Sometimes we cannot see God's greater vision for us because our hearts and our eyes and our affections are still fixed on a lesser vision. That thing has to die. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated upon the throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice who called him, and the house was filled with smoke. Isaiah knew the temple. He knew its dimensions. He knew its chambers. He knew its rituals. He knew its glory. 
This was Solomon's temple, a place that had been filled with the smoke of incense and the burnt offerings populated with priests wearing their fine linen, a place that was appointed with gold. It was bustling with worshipers who would travel to see this temple from the four corners of the earth. He knew this temple. And suddenly in a vision, Isaiah sees the heavenly reality on which the earthly temple was based. Suddenly the blinders come off and he sees the big picture. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. The train of his robe, of his majesty in, in Isaiah's vision. And visions are always out of scale. And Isaiah in his vision as he's trying to take all of this in sees the train of his robes filling the whole temple. Do you get the magnitude of this? That's what, that's what Isaiah is trying to communicate. The magnitude of what he saw. And the robes fill the whole temple. He sees creatures, seraphim, whose name means, by the way, fiery ones. And they are creatures who seem to exist only for the cause of God's holiness and declaring his holiness. Holy, holy, holy. They cry out and the place is shaken to its foundations and the house is filled with smoke. What a vision. What an over, overwhelming, an overcoming of all of the senses, a sudden exposure to a scene so glorious and so ominous and so powerful that kings and armies and treasures and temple are suddenly forgotten. In that moment of revelation, nothing else in life matters. It's a seismic event. It's an earthquake, but it's an earthquake in reverse. We know earthquakes as those powerful occurrences that destroy everything. The earthquake that takes place with the revelation of the glory of God is an earthquake in reverse because it removes all the rubble of our earthbound vision and replaces it with a greater vision of God's goodness and glory. Suddenly, when God gives you a vision, all of the junk in life is reordered and life takes on an order that we never knew before. We need this greater vision. You need to understand where you fit within God's plan because suddenly your life will take on its purpose and its meaning and its order. Seismic event. So long as our hearts are fixed on temporal realities, we're blind to greater spiritual realities. Realities that change everything in life. Almost 100 years ago, I can't remember her name to help to, to, to save me right now. Fortunately, I don't need to remember her name to be saved. But she wrote to him, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things, some of you know it, of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We've got it backwards. I fear that we have so turned our eyes on wealth and comfort and success that the things of Christ have grown strangely dim. We've settled for a lesser vision. Binding ourselves to kings and to kingdoms that must surely fail. And to affections that become our shackles. You realize that's what happens when we have no redeeming vision, when, when Jesus isn't given his place of lordship, earthbound affections will ultimately become the point of our bondage. They become idols to us. It, whatever it is, becomes what we're all about rather than being all about Jesus. We become hopelessly chained by the things that we love when that love is not properly placed. We've got it so backwards. We've settled for that lesser vision. I fear that we don't see the Lord enthroned at all, that we have, have lost a sense of his glory, that we have, that we have forgotten if we, if we ever knew what it means to be holy. His holiness can't be experienced without effect in our lives. 
A lot of folks have this attitude these days. Holy, I know the Bible says be holy, but I'm... (laughs) I can't, so... Don't really know what God was talking about there. And I understand that his righteousness is imputed to us in Christ Jesus. I understand all of that. But the command in the scripture is also an injunction for us to examine the way that we live. Not just to say grace, grace, grace will cover it all. We recognize that grace covers it all and the power of that statement that his grace is so wonderful puts us on our knees before him. Isaiah's vision of God then resulted in a transforming experience. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he'd taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. We cannot grasp God's holiness and not our sinfulness. We cannot experience a revelation of God that does not bring to us a revelation of self. Forgiveness and repentance are two sides of the same coin. Forgiveness and repentance, two sides of the same coin. And when we see him in his holiness, something has, woe is me, something has to happen. We become convicted of our sin, and that conviction of sin should lead us to repentance. But it's a step that this generation is leaving out altogether. It's like, yeah, I know I'm a sinner. Sure, I'm a sinner, but I can't do really any better than this, and I've got to deal with God. Grace covers it all. And we close our eyes to simple, powerful Christian teaching revealed to us in the Scripture that shows us so clearly that when we come to that place of forgiveness, that place of forgiveness is arrived at by taking the road of repentance. Without repentance, there is No remission. Shedding of blood covers our sins. His blood covers our sins, but repentance, that's the step we take. We can't grasp God's holiness and not our sinfulness. Isaiah was suddenly then self-conscious as he has become God-conscious in a way that he's never been God-conscious before, suddenly now he becomes self-conscious. He knows, he knows that the great Moses hid his face when he thought he might lay his eyes on God, for he knew to see God he would die. (laughs) That God was so perfect, that God was so holy, that God was so pure, that he even looked upon him in his sinful state, he would be dead like that. Moses knew this. Isaiah knows that Moses was afraid to even look. God is holy, he said, I'm not. How does he speak of himself now? It's interesting, it's interesting what Isaiah says. He says, I am unclean. If you've ever read that and you've thought, I wonder why he said it that way. Well, in the year that King Uzziah died, Uzziah was a leper. The leper who had to open his mouth when anyone came close to him and say, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. And what happens in the year that King Uzziah dies? There's a new revelation of the glory of God. And in that moment, he recognizes, I'm unclean. I'm unclean. He is sure, he is sure that he is about to die. So what's he going to do? He used to tremble when he just thought about the Ark of the Covenant that sat behind the curtain in the most holy place, holy of holies. He knew about the Ark. He knew it was was that place for the Jew. It was that place where the presence of God dwelt. And 
He knew the story. He knew the history. He knew of the priest who died for just touching the ark. He knew its dark power. Everybody knew that. And now the veil has been removed for him. And as the veil is removed, there is God himself seated upon the throne. What can you do in that moment? There's only one answer. Die. You die. But what should emerge through the smoke in that moment of naked terror? What should emerge but grace? A seraph with a glowing coal from the altar touches his lips and declares, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Somebody here today doesn't believe that can really happen. You've got to earn it. You've got to somehow qualify. There is that moment when aware as we become of our sin, aware that there is no way out, aware that there is no remedy for us, there is that moment when what Christ has done alone is extended to us by offer. Grace to you. You say, well, I just, Pastor, you just don't know what I've, I've done. No, I don't. And I'm not terribly interested. I know that hurts feelings, but it's, I'm really not. Have you ever been around someone who wants to tell you how bad their story is? After a while, it's like, stop, stop. Let's talk about the greatness of God's grace. I mean, it, you were a prostitute? Okay. We got good Bible for this. Jesus redeems people who have prostituted their lives. You are a murderer? That's not good news, but the bottom line is this. He saved murderers. You've been to the absolute, you've been the worst to your family. I've got to tell you, his grace has reached people who have destroyed their family, decimated their children, and even late in life, he gives them that chance and grace is extended to them. And if it's not extended to them, then all of us who have lived good lives, we don't get any grace either because it's not for one and not for all. God extends his grace. You say, it's too good to be true. I got news for you. If it's too good to be true, it's Jesus. This is what he extends. The only adequate answer as we stand before a holy God is like, die. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. You see, God will not compromise his holiness so he makes the unclean clean. Grace radicalized the young prophet. We don't like that word radicalized. We connect it to ISIS and Islam and we don't like that word. But I, I found no better word to describe what grace should do in our life. Grace should radicalize you. A lot of people treat grace as though, well, grace, God gave me grace. Thank you, God. Thank you. Appreciate that very much. And their life doesn't change. They don't understand grace. Grace should radicalize you. And if you haven't been radicalized by grace, I've got to wonder if you've known his grace at all. Could it be that Amazing Grace is just a song to you? If you sang it honestly, you'd say, interesting grace, how sweet the sound. Not so amazing. Are you truly amazed at the grace of God? Have you come to that point where you say, are you kidding me? The God of heaven has done what for me? Upon receiving God's cleansing gift, and this is the rather stunning part of the story, Isaiah is animated now. The story reveals here an engaging moment. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. Grace demands a response. Radicalizing grace demands a response. That response begins with gratitude, but it only finds its end in complete surrender. Grace begins with gratitude, 
The end of grace is surrender. Absolute laying down of arms. Lord, I am now yours. For me, few lyrics compare to those written by Isaac Watts, the hymnist, who can't close their eyes here and hear the opening strains of joy to the world, the Lord. It's endured, hasn't it? It's in an age where Christian songs, you know, last for maybe five years. We're still singing joy to the world. How about I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise? There's about 600 other hymns that he wrote, but none surpassed the beauty of when I survey the wondrous cross. And in the fourth stanza, he says, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Radicalizing grace demands the soul, the life, your all, your everything. It demands it. In one moment, Isaiah is certain of his impending destruction for his own uncleanness. In the, in the very next moment, he's making himself available as a vessel for God. In one moment, he shuns God's attention. He's, I'm unclean. Don't look my way. Please don't kill me. I'm worthy of... There, there, is one, there is this one moment in that revelation where Isaiah wants to hide somewhere. More smoke. I want to hide behind the smoke. He, he doesn't want to be seen by God. It's like he's watching all of this and he realizes in a moment, oh no, if God sees me, he'll kill me on the spot. And as grace takes hold and the cleansing, as the cleansing comes, all of a sudden, what's he do? Here am I. Look at me. Hear me, send me, use me. Isaiah is captured, then he's convicted, then he's cleansed, then he's commissioned. And I would submit to you that's how God works in all of our lives. Lest we frustrate the process, he captures us, convicts us cleanses us, commissions us. It occurs to me that the only thing over which Isaiah had control in this whole episode was his response to God. The only thing he had any control over was his response to God. Think about that for a moment. Those of you who feel like life is out of control, those of you who struggle trying to find your place and your way, the only thing that Isaiah had control over in this point was his response to God. And here we are 2,700 years later and absolutely nothing has changed. Listen to me, friends. We, we control virtually nothing in life. My life is completely out of control. Mine. But it's in his hands. I control virtually nothing but my response to God. That's, that's all I have. It might help you simplify your life, understanding that really life comes down to this. My response to God. He's been talking. He's been talking. He's been talking. He's been extending. He's, he's brought the seraph with the coal of fire to touch your lips. He's come to, he's come to set you free. The only thing you control in this is your response to him. It's the one thing he wants from you. Your absolute response to him. We control nothing. Time. Time won't stop. It doesn't, does it? I'm, I'm in this weird place where I look at my daughters now and I see that they're adults, all of them. 
You can't believe it, neither can I. I'm a grandfather five times over. Thanks for that. All of a sudden, you wake up one day and say, man, this is going too fast. And I remember when I started in the ministry, I was looking at 40 years, 50 years. I'm looking at my preaching ministry and I'm saying, you know, Lord, you hold me in the palm of your hand, but realistically, 12, 10, 8, you say, no, stop and think about it. You look at life and it has passed so quickly and you shake yourself and say, how did it all come to this? We can't control time. Weather, <laughs> weather's not going to be tamed. Government, I've decided that the government just swings around like a pinata. And every four years we take a whack at it. And sometimes candy falls out. And sometimes it's just a bunch of stuffing. Government. And life serves up the bitter and the sweet. All kinds of things I can't conquer. I can't conquer pain. I've stopped trying to silence criticism. What a waste of time. I can't eradicate hatred. I can't make anybody love me. So we'll be loving and people will love you. And I know that, I know that, I know that. But, but I can respond to God. It's the greatest power he ever gave me or you. It's the power that changes everything in your life. That moment when you respond to God, where you take what you have and say, okay, Lord, I'm responding to you. I'm responding to you. For by his grace, I have, you have at your discretion the power that changes everything. Responding to the love of God shown in Christ Jesus. That love awaits a response. God, you see, will not take us by force. At times, I wish he would. Anyone else? Lord, just come take control of my life, we say. Like we want God to step in and just Bigfoot. And when he does, just stomp out all of the stuff that we struggle with. And he will never do that. Because he won't have us by force. He won't have us by invasion. And he won't have us by some simple transaction alone. Although he has paid the price for us. He'll not join in some kind of partnership with us where he comes a, whereby he comes a, like a timeshare. Two weeks of God out of every year. A deal we make with him. No, he's not going to have us on those terms. He will have us by love or not at all. By love or not at all. Can you see him, the one who died for you? Or are you captive to a lesser vision? Has his grace touched you? Or have you not seen yourself for who you really are? Have you responded? Or will you walk away from the one moment in life that can truly change every moment? God is holy. Woe is me. Grace is mighty. Love is extended. I have power to do one thing with my life. Only one. That's how I responded.